Hello and welcome to this RSM webinar. We're looking at the delicate issue of estate planning, inheritance tax matters, and giving practical considerations and examples during these difficult and challenging times. The information being presented to you is correct as of April the 28th, and as more information and relevant guidance becomes available, it will be shared via the RSM Coronavirus Hub on our UK website. That's rsmuk.com. This is the fourth series of RSM webinars. We have previously produced webinars on the job retention furlough scheme and workforce costs, on funding and the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, and on cash flow generation during, uh, during these uh, period of uh, difficulty through tax reliefs and reclaims. Recordings of all are available via the website. We are recording this webinar and it, along with the slides, will be made available to everyone who has registered for this event. In terms of housekeeping, uh, please do check that you've muted your microphone so that we can reduce distractions. We have centrally tried to mute everyone's microphones, but sometimes it doesn't cover everyone, particularly late joiners. Obviously, we are all home working and relying on broadband connectivity, so please do bear with us if any technical gremlins or indeed small peoples or pets creep into this presentation. We do want this webinar to be interactive with your questions, so please do use the Q&A function to send in your questions. If you review the screen, you can see where you need to go. Uh, please try and avoid the, the chat box option. Uh, just stick to the Q&A uh, box, that would be great. And time permitting, I will ask our presenters as many questions as time will allow. So in terms of our presentation team today, I'm pleased to introduce our great team of RSM specialists. Firstly, Sophie St. John. Sophie is one of our partners in RSM Legal LLP, where she leads our private client legal practice, providing support and advice on a wide range of legal and tax issues relating to wealth, estate and succession planning, and wealth preservation structures. She has a particular focus on internationally mobile, high net worth families. Next up is Alex Langrenar who is a private client lawyer in RSM Legal LLP. She advises individuals on complex wills, trust creation and administration, lifetime and succession planning, domicile and lasting powers of attorney. Alex is a qualified member of the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners. And finally, Rachel D'Souza. Rachel is a chartered tax advisor and a partner in RSM's London private client tax practice. Her experience spans all areas of UK personal tax, but with a particular specialism in trust and corporate structures for family wealth preservation, the use of tax efficient investment vehicles and tax efficiencies allowed by legislation. <coughs> Rachel is, an, is industry recognized and spent many years in the big four and also the Royal Bank of Canada. And finally, I'm Simon Hart. I'm RSM's knowledge management and international partner, and I'm your host for today. In terms of our agenda, we're going to start with probate and wills, move on to the capital, capital gains tax loss utilisation uh, policies before moving on to the topic of inheritance tax and then concluding the webinar with your questions. So without further ado, let's kick off with Sophie and probate. Hi, my name is Sophie St. John. Thank you for attending today's webinar the aim of which is to provide some guidance and comfort from the perspective of personal affairs at what is such an unsettling and uncertain time for everybody. Most of us get caught up in our day-to-day -day lives, often taking for granted that we will eventually get to the more challenging items on our to-do list, but in the meantime, they can wait till tomorrow, next week, next year. For some, the pandemic may have brought into sharp focus the possibility that those items have been put off for just a little bit too long. And now the new normal means that it isn't as easy as it was to put your personal affairs in order. For example, to have some of those difficult conversations and to put documentation in place. Some of the more challenging items on the to-do list are often, if I were to pass away, who's going to run the family business that I've worked so hard to build and grow? Who will get what? 
Did you know that when you pass away, all your assets are frozen, including bank accounts in your sole name? And as far as the family business is concerned, you simply fall out of the picture. This reality can leave your family and business in a very difficult position. For example, there's nobody to run the business, compromised signing authorities on company bank accounts, maybe a lack of funds for your spouse and dependents to access, who will pay the school fees, university fees. We thought it would be useful to provide an outline from a practical perspective of the probate process, what happens if you don't leave a will, or your will is out of date, in order to demystify some common misconceptions and to provide some practical and useful high-level ideas and options outside the scope of preparing a will, whether that be a new will or your very first will. So what is probate and what does it involve? Probate is required to access most assets following death. The process is administratively burdensome and time consuming. It's not uncommon for a simple probate to take many months, let alone a complex one, which can take years. The probate process involves some key steps. The main ones include, firstly, registering the death with all relevant institutions, authorities and companies. Now, if you stop to think about it, of all of the banks that you hold accounts with, the pension providers you have pensions with, investment managers where you hold portfolios, your utility companies, telephone companies that provide services to you and so on, you can start to see just how many organizations needed to be contacted in any probate matter. Secondly, identifying all an individual's worldwide assets and obtaining valuations of them. This can range from probate valuations, portfolio valuations, jewelry, art, cars. All of these require valuations from an appropriate specialist. Valuations will need to stand up to scrutiny from the revenue. You then need to complete and submit the inheritance tax return and pay the inheritance tax within six months of death. You will pay off debts such as the funeral costs, your income tax liability, inheritance tax, mortgage on properties. Only once the probate registry has evidence that the inheritance tax has been paid by way of a receipt, can a grant be applied for? And only once the probate registry has issued the grant can assets of the estate be collected in. And finally, only once the grant has been issued can the estates and assets be distributed in accordance with a will, or in the absence of a will, the intestacy rules. During this whole period, there is a lack of access to funds except for one purpose, paying some liabilities, and these are very limited. So it's things like the IHT and funeral expenses. Depending on the value of a person's estate, their family circumstances and asset profile, the availability of cash to pay inheritance tax can be a problem. Some assets, some estates rather, simply do not have the cash to pay the tax because while the estate is valuable, it's tied up in things like bricks and mortar, shares, the family business, which cannot be sold or cannot be sold easily, or the timing of a sale can be challenging. For example, a portfolio value has decreased and it's showing no signs of rebounding. Some estates have to bridge the gap by borrowing from banks to fund the inheritance tax. Given all of this, you can begin to see why the process takes so long and how it can cause significant issues for the surviving family. 
Meanwhile, running alongside is the question, did the deceased have a will or not? And if there was a will, was it an English will or a will created in another country? If there's no will, the intestacy rules apply. It's really unlikely that these wills will provide as the deceased would have chosen, especially in the context of succession of the family business and protection of children and grandchildren. The intestacy rules are complicated and they have to be applied to the specific facts of the case. If we use a simple scenario by way of example, where the deceased leaves a spouse or civil partner and two surviving children, the net estate, so after all tax and liabilities have been paid, would broadly speaking be distributed as follows. The spouse would receive all the personal chattels and a cash legacy of £270,000. And the balance of the estate would be split into two equal shares. The first share would pass to the spouse and the second share would pass to the children in equal shares as and when they reach the age of 18. This of course begs the question, would this leave your spouse with enough? Would you want your children to inherit at 18? Often the answer to those questions is no. And the issue can become even more complicated where you have blended families. I will now pass over to my colleague Alex, who will talk about wills and lockdown. Thank you, Sophie. Hi everyone, Alex here. If you have a will, you're likely to be in a better position because you will have gone through the thought process of what you want to achieve from the perspective of providing for your nearest and dearest, the most tax efficient way of doing so while protecting those close to you, and the best way for the family business to continue to thrive. The family business may be something which passes outside the will because you planned it and passed the business down during your lifetime. Things can sometimes not go to plan, especially if the will in question is outdated and has not been reviewed regularly. With that in mind, it's worth thinking about following. When you made your last will, when you last reviewed it, as a result of changes in your personal circumstances, so things like births, marriages, deaths, divorces, etc., and or to ensure that it still reflects your wishes. Finally, you might wish to check whether it needs updating generally. Now, what I've just said may have caused you to think, oops, I don't have a will, I should make one, or I have a will, but I can't remember where it is. You might then manage to track it down and realize how long it's been since you did it and that it might be out of date. Nothing is ever simple, is it? So the English requirements relating to valid will execution date back to 1837. Clearly, the world has moved on since then, but the rules remain unchanged. So what's required? You must sign and date the will in the presence of two independent witnesses, who then in your and one another's presence, witness by signing their names and providing their details. So this is full, their full name, address and occupation. During lockdown and social distancing, it is exceptionally difficult for someone to execute a will and comply with these requirements. Whilst this issue has been brought to the Ministry of Justice's attention, it's understood that government ministers are still reviewing whether to change the law, and if so, which options put before Parliament might be selected. While we wait in the hope that rules might be relaxed temporarily during COVID-19, we have come up with some practical solutions for you. For example, the person making the will with their two witnesses could congregate around a car bonnet with the will secured to the windscreen by a windscreen wiper. They could meet in a park, execute the will, perhaps by a park bench, or two witnesses watch the testator sign the will through a window. The will is then posted to them via the letterbox, which they witness with the testator watching and post the will back through the letterbox. 
These can all be done whilst remaining two metres apart, wearing gloves and using different pens. If the practicalities of a new will are just too much, there are other things you can think about from a practical perspective. Firstly, is the family home in your sole name? Do you perhaps want to transfer it into joint names with your spouse or civil partner now? A deed would be required to achieve this, but the formalities for signing are not as onerous as a will, although witnesses are still required. If the property is transferred to your spouse in the right way, this might achieve your surviving spouse inheriting your share of the family home should you pass away without the need for a will. Secondly, what about your bank accounts? Are these in your sole name? If so, do you want to put one of them into joint names with your spouse or partner? If you don't want to make an account joint, do you want to perhaps top up your spouse or partner's account? Either of these options would allow your spouse or partner to have access to funds while your personal accounts were frozen and may remain so for some time. Thirdly, moving on to family business. Are you the sole shareholder and director of the business? Have you perhaps put off appointing a family member you've identified as your successor or a director and issued them some shares? Do you want to appoint another director to the business just in case? Or give some shares to the person you envisage would take the business forward when you're gone? Moving on to letter of wishes. Could this accompany your existing will and provide you with some comfort? Letters of wishes are not legally binding, but you would expect the individuals who administer your estate to give them weight and apply them where they could. Where this is feasible, sorry, pardon me, whether this is feasible will of course depend on the terms of your current will. Similarly, if you don't have a will, you would hope that those benefiting under the intestacy rules might be persuaded to follow your wishes to the extent that they could do so. In relation to lifetime gifting, a note of caution, you should only consider making gifts in your lifetime if you're comfortable to do so. You should not expect to receive the gift back or have use of it. Broadly speaking, a gift to a spouse should not cause any CGT or IHT issues, but it would be prudent to take advice before making the gift. A gift to anyone else may have CGT and or IHT implications, which you will want to understand before triggering them. I'll now pass over to my colleague, Rachel, who will touch on some of the associated tax issues in more detail. So Alex and Sophie, for those um, highlighting the issues of making a will, I'm actually going to turn to focus on the tax issues that arise in the context of estate planning, particularly at this time when share prices have dropped dramatically. I will then go on to highlight how our tax system deals with cases where IHT can be charged on the same value twice and how it, how it has anticipated that there can be drops in asset value between the date of gift or inheritance and when the tax actually becomes due. Thus, the rest of this webinar will focus on estate planning in the coronavirus environment. Firstly, however, we're going to look at CGT and losses. This is because estate planning generally involves giving away assets or at least selling them to release the cash to give away. And therefore, it's important to remind ourselves what the position is when we dispose of an asset at a loss. Firstly, current year losses are amalgamated with current year gains, and the balance, if any, is taxable after the deduction of the annual exempt amount, which is currently £12,300. If there are losses brought forward from earlier years, those losses can be used to reduce the amount within the charge to tax up to the annual exempt amount. In other words, you do not lose the benefit of the tax-free allowance. CGT losses on unquoted shares can be used in the same way as I have just described. Alternatively, they can be set off against current year or prior year's income or both. Obviously, this is more valuable if you are paying income tax at 40% or 45% as relief is given at those higher tax rates. However, 
This income tax relief is only available for disposals of shares in qualifying trading companies, and this includes enterprise investment schemes, venture capital trusts, and AIM quoted shares. Now, you may remember that in 2013, a limit was introduced to restrict the amount of loss relief that could be claimed by an individual each year. Relief was limited to the greater of £50,000 and 25% of income. However, this restriction does not reply in relation to disposals of EIS shares. And lastly, you should also note that this is an all or nothing claim, meaning that losses will extinguish personal allowances where they would otherwise be available. It is worth mentioning that if you sell or gift an asset to a connected person and that gift gives rise to a CGT loss, the loss can only be offset against gains on disposals of assets to that same person. So with all of that in mind, let us now have a look at why you should consider reviewing your estate planning strategy now. As a quick reminder, IHT arises on your death by valuing your estate, deducting the available nil rate band, which is currently £325,000, and taxing the balance at 40%. Effective estate planning therefore involves reducing the value of your estate by the time of your death so that you cannot benefit from the assets that you have disposed of. This is why lifetime gifts of assets are so popular. Making a gift to an individual does not create an immediate inheritance tax charge. Instead, it starts a seven year clock. And these gifts are known as potentially exempt transfers or pets. In other words, as long as you survive for a period of seven years from the date of the gift, the value of that gift falls outside your inheritance tax estate entirely. Even if you do not survive the full seven years, taper relief will apply to reduce the IHT payable on your death as long as you have survived for at least three years. Therefore, even before the coronavirus era, gifting was a sensible strategy to pursue in respect of IHT mitigation. When talking to individuals about making gifts, an objection which is often raised is that there will be a CGT charge on disposing of the asset which will either form the gift or from which the cash will be derived to make the gift. This is, of course, perfectly understandable as no one likes to pay tax on gains where they have not actually received any cash on disposal. However, in the coronavirus era, it is very possible that the assets will have fallen in value. And of course, in this context, we know that share values in particular have fallen dramatically in recent weeks. Individuals may therefore wish to consider gifting share portfolios or other assets whilst the value is low and little or no capital gains tax will be payable. Just as an aside, you may wish to sell portfolios on the open market and give the cash instead, but this very much depends on your personal circumstances. As already mentioned, the gift starts seven year clock. Let us assume that the donor does die within that seven year period. The gift is then brought back into the charge to IHT. The value of that gift for IHT purposes is the value at the date of the gift rather than the market value at the date of death. So if there is an increase in value between the date of gift and death, it is the lower value that comes in the charge. Gifts of any value can be made. One strategy that is often used is to make gifts up to the value of the nil rate band of £325,000 per person to a UK discretionary trust. The reason being that this can be done at no IHT cost. Indeed, if husband and wife make joint gifts, £650,000 can be gifted in this way. Discretionary trusts are popular as they provide an element of control as the beneficiary cannot spend the money directly. 
However, care is required. Gifts made in excess of the nil rate band carry a lifetime inheritance tax charge at 20%. For larger values, donors may consider gifts using a family or personal investment company. This is another way in which wealth could be passed down the generations without the donor losing control over how that wealth is utilized. In this case, the larger values don't carry a lifetime IHT charge, rather they would be considered as pets. Individuals should also consider taking out life insurance as a simple and often cost-effective way of mitigating any IHT charge that may become due. This is a strategy which provides for a cash sum to pay the IHT rather than seeking to reduce the IHT bill itself by giving away assets during lifetime. Lastly, of course, everyone should keep their estate planning strategy under regular review. As we have seen, circumstances can change dramatically and very quickly, and this will impact each person's future planning. Before we finish, I'm just going to touch on some little known but valuable IHT reliefs that exist. Quick succession relief does what it says on the tin. It is designed to reduce the tax payable when the same property has been subject to more than one charge to IHT. It is important to note that quick succession relief does not apply where either transfer was either wholly exempt, for example, if there was a transfer between spouses, or it is chargeable, but within the nil rate band, so no actual IHT was paid. So in other words, for quick succession relief to apply, inheritance tax must have been payable on both the transfers under consideration. We've provided a little example here, um, but what I wanted to highlight is how the formula works. So the reduction that is allowed is, is given by the formula A over B times C times D. And what this formula does is apply the estate rate of tax on the earlier transfer, which is the A over B part, to the net increase in the second estate to find the amount of tax on the later transfer, which is attributable to the increase, and then the percentage reduction is applied. So in this particular case, we end up with the position in Sam's estate where his chargeable amount is £730, and in the absence of quick succession relief, tax would be due at £292,000. However, as he died within three years um, of receiving the earlier gift, in this case, he's entitled to £118,260 IHT quick succession relief, thereby significantly reducing the IHT due on his own estate. On the next slide, we're just going to have a brief look at sale of shares relief, which you know may be very pertinent given where we are now. And this is allowable. It's designed to take the account where shares have dropped in value between the date of death and the following 12 months. There are various conditions which have to be met, but broadly, it's we're talking about a sale of the investments within 12 months of death by the executors. In the example given here, we will see that in this estate, shares have been sold, one producing a gain and two producing a loss. You have to amalgamate all the gains and losses to reach the net loss figure, which in this case is £5,000. IHT relief is only given on the net loss, not on the gross loss. And lastly, there's a similar relief available in respect of lifetime gifts where the value of the gift has fallen between the date of the gift and the date when the donor died, when it is brought within the charge to IHT, as long as that property is still owned at that time. So in summary, consider gifting now whilst asset values are low, but do watch your CGT position. Where death has already occurred, check whether any of these loss in value reliefs apply. Gifting now has no tax downside. 
your CGT will be based on reduced values, assuming asset values have dropped. And IHT will fall away entirely if you still survive for the seven years, or will be based on the currently depressed values. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to some questions now. Um, let's start. So Alex, here's an international uh, related question for you, I think. Um, if we've got, uh, what's the situation where the deceased had dual nationality and assets in multiple countries and jurisdictions, uh, can a UK compliant will apply internationally? So that's a tricky one. Um, it depends really. There are lots of people who just have one will. Uh, so we have lots of clients who have assets in different countries and they choose to make a global will. Um, what you've got to remember is that different jurisdictions have their own laws and rules. So what I would say is it really depends which other country you're a dual citizen of, um, what assets you have in other countries, um, and we would assess sort of your fact pattern. And then we would say to you, OK, you've got a villa in Spain or Italy. Um, let's look to carve that out separately and have that dealt with under the um, Italian jurisdiction or have a Spanish will, for example, um, rather than have a UK try to cover everything. Um, so it's really just assessing, I think, what your fact pattern is. And then we can um, take it from there. I'm a dual national myself, so I completely appreciate that it can be quite a nightmare sometimes to um, organise everything so that it ties up nicely. Oh, thank you, Alex. Uh, here's a situation, um, what would be the tax implications, so Rachel I think this one's for you, what would be the tax implications between two cohabiting partners if the uh, principal private residence is put into joint names from a previously sole name? Um, so if we've, if we've got cohabiting persons then they're not treated as a civil partners, obviously, or, or a married couple. And therefore, the, um, the principal private residence, the value of that would be split between the two of them from an inheritance tax perspective. All right. So if one of, right. Go, on, go ahead. I was going to say, so if one of them were to die, half of the value comes within their estate for inheritance tax purposes. Um, again, Sophie or Alex would have to con would have to comment on the legal uh, matters with regard to um, who then whether the the, the half the property transfers to the other to the other cohabiting partner. Yeah, uh, Sophie, do you want to cut in on that? Because there's a, there's a there's a related question about an unmarried couple cohabiting for for a number of years. Uh, does the intestacy rules apply in that case? Uh, well, taking the, the latter one first, um, intestacy rules do not recognise cohabiting couples at all. Um, that doesn't mean that there might not be another route for the cohabitee who survives to pursue a claim in another way, but they wouldn't naturally receive under anything under the intestacy rules. Um, touching or uh, following on from Rachel's comment on two cohabitees owning a property, now, um, from that perspective, that is where it is really important that the cohabitees have wills in place because if there isn't a will, as just mentioned, the intestacy rules wouldn't let anything pass to the surviving cohabitee, um, but there will still be an inheritance tax issue because there's no spouse exemption that would apply because they're not married or in a civil partnership. Okay, I think I've got that. And whilst I've got you, Sophie, here's a, here's a supplementary. Um, <laughs> you mentioned uh, in your presentation about accounts being frozen, bank accounts mm -hmm. being frozen. Uh, what, what happens to, for instance, life policy payments? Where do they go um, uh, to well, provide life cash liquidity? Life policy payments should fall outside the individual's estate if they have been set up properly. So ordinarily, a life policy is accompanied by a declaration of trust which will say to whom the policy proceeds would go um, when they pay out. So the question that I think has been asked on the Q&A, it may be that that provides liquidity to address the inheritance tax. 
it is a process that is often followed with that in mind. But obviously, if those policy proceeds pass to um, a child, there's no guarantee that the child would necessarily um, make the cash available to do that. But they do provide liquidity outside the estate, so they would be well, frozen. Right, they're outside of the estate, fine. Yeah. Okay. Just a practical point on that I wanted to add about the life policy. What you would need to do is check with the provider what their requirements are to release funds. So some of them might just want a death certificate for the deceased and others might insist on a grant of probate. So your best approach is just to contact them directly and find out exactly what they need. OK. Um, tax free cash from pensions. Uh, can they be gifted ex exempt from IHT? So is, is, it, is, it, is, it a, is it a gift from norm, or is it a gift from normal income? Right, sorry, I can't quite see that question on the screen, but the, the normal rule with um, with UK, so register, from registered pension schemes, is that if the um, primary, if the member dies before the age of 75, and it doesn't matter whether the pension has started or not, then the whole value, remaining value in that pension scheme um, is passed to the heirs, both income tax free and IHT free. Um, and the general rule is, of course, that any value within pension plans is not within the person's IHT estate. OK, thank you, Rachel. Uh, slightly technical one here. Um, someone died March 2019. IHT was paid in October 2019. <clears throat> not all of the funds were sold within 12 months due to a, a legal error with probate. Can the 12 month rule be extended for the funds that will now be sold uh, also at a loss? Um, again, no, the, the, the legislation is very clear. The um, share sales have to take place within 12 months of the date of death. So in that particular case, if the sales are occurring after 12 months, that loss in value relief for the sale of shares won't apply. OK, thank you, Rachel. Um, capital gains tax related now, so I think that's still with you, Rachel. Am I yeah. right in thinking that CGT games need to be paid in year now rather than the following January? Oh, what a great question. Um, the change that has occurred is for CGT gains on the sale of uh, residential real estate. That now, ne now needs to be paid within 30 days of the sale and in most cases a separate CGT return needs to be submitted within that 30 day period. For all other gains, the 31 January um, uh, 31 January date remains. Thank you very much. A uh, slight international question here. Uh, what might be the impact uh, if the UK is not able to keep its position in the international legal fold? Uh, resulting in British law not being recognised uh, due to Brexit. Um, I mean, oh, I yeah, I yeah. think that's one for, for Alex and I. Well, I mean, I think that all remains to be seen, unfortunately, um, until such time as our exit um, from the EU and laws are um, put in place where at the moment, for example, we rely on European laws and we then have to implement them here. I think it's very much a case of watch this space with Brexit, unfortunately. OK, Sophie, that was a good good dodge there and a great question, Michael. We nearly caught them out. <laughs> um, here we go. What's the most tax efficient way of gifting money to my children? Uh, there are three of them. They aren't taxpayers at the moment in order to buy a property. Uh, well, are they, the question is, are they already adults? Um, if they're already adults, i.e. over the age of 18, then of course you can just gift them the cash, which is the simplest and easiest way, because from your perspective, if you've got the cash, there's no asset to dispose of, um, and it will just simply start the seven-year clock, and then it's up to the children to, of course, use that money in the way that you wish them to use it, i.e. to buy the property. And it's often it's that that um, a distinction between gifting them the cash and are the children going to use the money in the way that you want them to use it 
which leads parents to looking at different solutions which are slightly more complex, such as whether the discretionary trust is worthwhile or, or whether these family or personal investment companies are worthwhile. But generally, they probably wouldn't be if they're looking to buy um, a house in which the children are going to live in. Thank you, Rachel. Sophie, here's one for you. Uh, if a joint bank account owner dies, does this mean that the account is frozen with regard to the surviving person? I'm assuming that means in, uh, without a will. Where you've got a joint bank account, it should pass to the surviving individual, hence the reference that we made during the um, presentation to the idea of if all, for example, your bank accounts are currently in your sole name, that there is an advantage to having them in a joint name to get round that issue. Thanks very much, Sophie. Yes, that's a good one to know, and it's actually very topical. Here's another topical question relating to asset protection trusts. Are they any good to protect assets from care home fees? Uh, and what are the tax consequences of having such a trust? Uh, and indeed, how do you get the assets out of the trust at a later date? I think that one might be a mixture of all of you. To be, to be it, it is a bit, isn't it? Um, I'm not going to cover any of the legal side of it. I'll leave, leave Sophie or Alex to comment on that. Um, is it a good way to protect assets from care home fees? Um, well, I guess that's sort of bankruptcy areas and so on, legal side. Tax consequences of having such a trust. If we're talking about an onshore, so a UK trust, UK trusts pay income tax at the rate of principal to trusts, which is 45%. Um, and then the beneficiary receives uh, distributions, well, i.e. the income, um, with a 45%, effectively 45% tax credit attached, so they can receive a repayment of tax if they do not pay tax at that rate. For capital gains tax purposes, uh, onshore trusts pay CGT as well in the normal way, um, and any capital distributions are, are then made free of, of UK taxes to um, to uh, to the um, sorry to the beneficiary, um, and then the one thing we have to remind ourselves of is: Are we talking about settler or interested trust? If we've retained a benefit from um, that particular trust, the assets um, are, are not only within the IHT regime for trusts, but they also remain in the IHT estate of the settler. So, um, so very great care needs to be taken there because you could find yourself within two IHT regimes, so twice um, subject to IHT. Sophie, over to you for the legal side. Um, from the perspective of care home fees, it's something that you have to be really, really careful with. I think it is very hard to expect to set up a trust and avoid care home fees. It circles back to a degree to what Rachel was saying in the context of is it settler or interested or is it not? Um, it, it's one that requires some detailed consideration. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, we're going to move on to to to, to slightly more uh, post-COVID economic and fiscal policy speculation here. So. A couple of linked questions. Um, I've seen commentary that IHT may increase as it did post World War II, up to 80%. Um, how likely is this to occur as a result of the uh, economic and fiscal consequences of COVID-19? And there's a related one as well in terms of there's some speculation that, 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 that potentially exempt transfers could be abolished in the next budget. What, what are your views, Rachel? Oh, both really good questions. Now, IHT is already in the spotlight um, as one of those taxes which needs reform. And indeed, both the Office of Tax Implication and I forget the name of the other board um, have made um, quite detailed recommendations as to some changes that could occur within the existing framework of, of the inheritance tax law. What, um, what we haven't looked at yet is whether IHT remains fit for purpose. Um, so within the context of what we know, there has been no suggestion that the rate of IHT of 40% will change. Um, clearly, I think as, as a general comment, um, everybody, um, every, sort of all professional commentators believe that taxes will need to rise following um, all the intervention that the government has undertaken um, in regard to coronavirus. 
Um, of course, as of yet, nobody knows how that's going to be achieved. In the context of pets, um, the Office of Tax Implication um, suggested that um, the, the pet regime is changed. So at the moment, we have this seven year period, which, which I've talked about, and we have taper relief applying after three years. Um, the proposal is that the pets will go to a five year period. So once you've survived for a period of five years, the gift will fall out of the um, inheritance tax account, but there will be no taper relief at all. So it will, it's the, the change is designed to make that pet regime simpler for everyone to understand. Um, tax and simplification, there's a contradiction in terms. But what <laughs> well, you're absolutely right, Rachel, is that, is that post this crisis, in terms of the amount of borrowing that's had to be going on at a governmental level, we're going to see some type of, of changes, <clears throat> upward changes in, 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 uh, in tax rates and, and and anything to do with IHT is, is, is less of a political hot potato than some of the other taxes. Okay, here's a, here's a question, I think, for you, Sophie. Um, if a deceased was a sole director of a 100% owned company, can the executor appoint a director to that company? And similarly, if a deceased was a member of an LLP, can the executor, him or herself, assume the powers of the deceased as an LLP member? That's less likely to be governed by the position of the executors or anything to do with the will. When it comes to directors, you'd probably be looking at your articles of association for the company itself, which is more likely to govern how the company will be operating. And the same is true of uh, an LLP, its constitution and what it provides for. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, it depends on the LLP agreements many, in many respects. Um, a CGT question next, uh, Rachel, stand by. Uh, what's the effect from a CGT perspective of a sale of an overseas property by a UK domiciled person? Um, it's no different to any other asset. Um, the, you will um, value the asset, at the, obviously, at the, the date of sale. You have to value it in sterling terms. Um, so that is considered to be your sale proceeds. You deduct. Um, the cost of the asset, again, um, converted to sterling at the exchange rate at the date of purchase so that you calculate your gross gain in sterling terms. Whatever the gain is forms part of your capital gains for the year. You deduct your annual exempt amount um, if, you, if you have an annual exempt amount available and you pay tax at, oh, I'm going to say it's 20% rather than 28%. Um, but that might just need to be confirmed. All right. Um, whilst we're on that topic uh, of, of tax and IHT, here's, here's one more for you, Rachel. What are, the, what are the main tax and IHT considerations in transferring shares in an owner-managed, owner-founded UK registered company with a joint spouse ownership to one of the children? Um, Okay, so we've got an owner-managed business here, so it's very likely if this is a trading business, um, business property reliefs will apply. Um, so you've got no inheritance tax um, implications um, and there should be potentially no CGT or be done at a no gain, no loss transaction. Of course, what you will then need to look at is whether the child um, in his own right, have, um, having newly acquired those shares, will um, qualify for the same reliefs. So it's 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 a lot more of a um, rather than the pure tax implications. You need to consider the family um, situation and you know what that child is going to do, being now in control or having some of those shares, and what the impact that's going to have on the business and any other shareholders or directors within that business. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Sophie, Alex, here's one for you. Um, my wife has access to all my personal bank accounts, i.e. usernames, passwords, etc. Uh, that's brave. Uh, can, she, can she legally transfer money out of my bank account in case I die abruptly? Well, while you are alive and she has the signing authorities, she would be able to do that. At the moment you pass away, the account should be frozen and anything that is done by her post-death 
would arguably be fraud. Because there's an automatic authority to, to do that post death. So that's why in our slides we came up with a suggestion of actually topping up your spouse's account or making sure they've got access to rather than just relying on being able to and I, and I know that's how a lot of people work um, and, and it's easy but just as a precautionary measure that's why we've suggested that because you never know what you might what situation you might end up with and the banks can be very very difficult and you could be stuck so as uh, so I linked to that kind of unexpected aspect, you know, what's what's the pros and cons of popping to W H Smith or, or another uh, uh, similar uh, retailer and, and getting one of these off the shelf uh, wills? You know, do they cover probate, for instance? Um, a will, any will, is potentially better than nothing. Um, I have to admit that the experiences I have had um, with people doing the WH Smith versions is that, that they are far from ideal. Um, it is much better to get some professional advice rather than do it yourself. But if you don't want to do that, something is better than nothing. Absolutely. Um, here, here's a situation where, where, where we're happy to pass shares on to our two grandchildren. How do I ensure that they don't sell them or fritter away the cash? And I guess linked to that is, is another one where I, I want to give to a grandchild, uh, a, an adult grandchild. How, how do I protect the assets uh, in case they divorce? Well, um, you can't protect the assets if they are to divorce if you have given it to them directly. Where there are concerns of that nature, uh, protecting them from a spouse you have no faith in or the potential for that to happen, you need to think about other situations and solutions, perhaps something like creating a trust which that individual would be a benefit the beneficiary of. Um, but as soon as you've given it across, you know, all bets are off. If they get married and divorced, it's part of their estate and potentially would be divvied up by the matrimonial court. And so the first bit of the question. Uh, so the first bit was, um, I'm happy to pass it over to my two grandchildren. How do I oh, ensure yeah. I don't fritter it away? Um, <laughs> and, 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 and that's the same sort of thing. Once you've passed ownership across, you can't. So you have to think about other ways potentially to um, provide them with those um, assets that you're thinking of. It comes back full circle. This is where trusts potentially have a role to play. They get a lot of bad press that you know people are trying to hide assets or it's all about tax. But actually more often than not, it isn't about that. It's about creating some control over what may or may not be done with those assets long term so that you appoint trustees who can then monitor said grandchildren's spending habits and make sure that the cash is being deployed in the way that you would have envisaged. An alternative to the trust um, is the a family or personal investment company. And we see um, a lot of our clients who, um, who have come from a, 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 an owner managed business background preferring to use um, the family or investment company route because it's a corporate structure and it's a structure that they therefore understand because they've traded through a company through their business life. And the idea of using a company is very similar to the trust in that you can give away your assets. So you started your inheritance tax seven year clock, it's a potentially exempt transfer, but by by where you structure the particular this particular company, you, you take you you retain the control. Generally it's mum and dad retain the control. Um, whereas the children effectively are the beneficial owners of the value. Um, and in this way, they ca the children cannot then just sell the shares um, and take the money out and spend it on whatever it is they like, because it's mum and dad who are effectively the directors of the company and have to approve any, um, any distributions or indeed how the, how the value is actually invested. So that's often a, an alternative solution which um, as I say, which especially owner managed businesses um, prefer to use rather than the trust. So it very much dependent on individual circumstances as to what's the best result. Okay, time for just one more question uh, relating to wills. How can I guarantee that my will will be found and indeed 
execute it as I wish and, and do I, you know, is there somewhere I can register it? Um, that, that is one we always recommend that clients, once they've done a will, tell their executors where they are storing it so that they will know where to find it. But there are, other, there are ways to register it. Um, I'm not sure that I've ever ha had a client who's done this, but there are organisations, one in particular, where you can register your will called certainty, which amounts to a, a, a national wills register where you can potentially be searching to see if a will has been logged on that. Yes, and just, and just a supplementary, just a question just popped in relating to, to um, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia related mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the onset of, of, or the increase in that. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about um, lasting powers of attorney. I assume that that seems that's a very topical and sensible thing to be doing when, it, it when is finalizing a, a will. Absolutely, and it's often something that we will mention to a client when they come in to talk about wills and estate planning, whether they've also given some thought to lasting powers of attorney. They are certainly worth doing. Um, as the person who asked the question raised, you know, how, how is anybody that um, your children going to help you operate once you've lost capacity to run your personal affairs? So appointing your children or whomever you trust, because these, these powers are quite powerful. Um, is certainly a, a very good idea and let's face it if everybody keeps their marbles they are never going to be used anyway it's a, a bit of an insurance policy of sorts. Oh, thank you okay so if you could just move the slide uh, deck on one um, yep. I'd just like to say if you've got any specific or further questions please pop an email through to the COVID-19 inquiries at rsmuk.com and we'll do our very best to try and uh, point you in the right direction and again if you want any further information on the whole topic as well as the wider coronavirus issues please go to the coronavirus hub on the address there and finally just to make sure that we're sending you as much specific information as you need please go to the RSM UK website and fill out your preferences so that we can make sure we're sending you exactly what you need so that concludes our webinar for this afternoon Thank you very much uh, for your attention and on behalf of the presentation team and indeed all of RSM, we wish you and your families the best of luck, best of health and we look forward to actually seeing you hopefully very soon. Thank you.